And we are live. Welcome to another episode of the New York Information Security Meetup. And I have the great pleasure to introduce Moti Cristal, who is the founder and CEO of Nest Consulting. Moti, thanks very much for joining. Much appreciated. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks, David. Thanks for inviting me. So I wanted to have you specifically on the show today to talk a bit about the kind of the current event that's happening currently, uh, you know, Ukraine and Russia. And, uh, you know, things were very much different than they were when we last spoke. And uh, you have, uh, you know, phenomenal background and you, um, you have an intrinsic um, knowledge of, of the kind of the Russian mindset because you've been dealing with them for so, so many years. So I wanted to get your perspective on the current events and what things are happening right now. So why don't we get started and then uh, maybe kind of recap of where we are today. You know, things have kind of progressed. Um, you know, there were some sort of negotiation that happened between Russia and Ukrainian that kind of fell through. Why don't we start with that? Like, you know, where, where, you know, where we stand today? Well, in terms of the general negotiation, in terms of the cyber sphere. Yeah. Well, I think we should start with kind of the general and then like the general, general deeper. Yeah. Deeper well, into what's in, happening. In the general, on the general level, uh, we see war on the ground, war on cyberspace, definitely information of propaganda war. And uh, as uh, actually, as the Russians always do in wherever they, they deploy forces is that they immediately initiate the negotiation track and that's interesting because in parallel to the uh, in parallel to the bombardment and the shooting and uh, uh, siege of some Ukrainian cities we see a continuous negotiation effort direct negotiation between uh, Ukrainian and Russian delegations and uh, very intensive international mediation effort, including Israeli uh, one, between uh, mainly between uh, Ukraine, Kiev, and, and Moscow, but other stakeholders are definitely involved. And what's interesting about this, Moti, is that uh, we, you know, here in the West, you know, we always, we have, a, you know, first we have kind of recency bias and then also a bias of things that we know, right? Because we typically negotiate with people we know that people are very similar to ourselves but this is not the case you know we they come from a very very different background and you have experience in negotiating with with russians uh on the kind of the cyber front talk to me about that in terms of like why dealing with people that are not similar to ourselves is you know is unique and is challenging it is unique and challenging mainly because we have some implicit assumption that uh, the other side is a rational actor. And uh, when we assume that the other side is a rational actor, we usually we project our rationality on their rationality, which means causing damage to my population, collapsing my economy, um, you know, uh, uh, developing my country, my state as a pariah state is bad thing. This is why I should stop shooting. However, this is probably not the mindset and not, that's not the rationale of, uh, of uh, the Kremlin, of, of Putin. What we see here in terms of information security language is a straightforward use of brute force. The way he believes um, his interests will be achieved is by using force without even, you know, blinking, without even uh, uh, stopping for uh, a ceasefire. Usually, you know, in traditional evolution of armed conflict, you, you fight for a couple of days and then uh, yeah, UN or there's a mediated ceasefire to allow negotiations to end hostilities. But here we see, as I mentioned in parallel, that uh, negotiations are conducted without ceasefire, which means that something in the way that Putin understands reality is completely different than the way uh, the West perceives reality. And, one, and when one party is willing to use brute force, regardless of costs to his own 
country, army, people, etc. That is a very challenging, um, you know, you, you need, it, it's a very challenging situation and you need to, you know, go or move out of your West comfort zone. Yeah, and it's also it's also very true, like in terms of how we see uh, the number of casualties, right? I mean, here in the West as well, like we, you know, everyone is is you know is accounted for, right? So if you have, you know, even five, ten people that are dying during a conflict, it's a big deal. But it's not necessarily the case of you know with with that regime, right? Is that is that correct? Yeah, it is. It is correct, and you know, I, I'm I'm uh, putting aside my cyber and ransomware and and this type of of negotiations. I'm an international negotiator, and one of my uh, most important advice uh, in international, you know, in negotiate internationally, globally, is suspend judgment. Okay, I agree with you hundred percent. The value of human life in the U.S. in the West definitely in Israel, is completely different than the value of human life in other countries, China, Russia. And uh, once we suspend judgment and we understand that there are regimes, there are leaders who will uh, not hesitate to sacrifice lives of uh, hundreds of their own people, just in order to achieve their political or military cause, once we understand that, we need to design a relevant engagement and negotiation strategy which, which takes into consideration that cultural dimension. Yeah, and, and it's super interesting. So let's dive into like what's happening, you know, from, from a cybersecurity perspective, you know, so that created uh, almost like a shockwave, right? People did not yeah. anticipate to have something like that. And immediately the reaction was like, oh, you know, hold on, what's, what does that mean to us? Because it, it, eventually every, every enterprise and, and people, the executives are looking at uh, what does that mean from our perspective? So, and I'm assuming that, again, because of your background, you've, you've had those frantic phone calls, people asking, hey, Moti, what's, what's going on? Should we be concerned? So maybe give us a, a kind of an idea of what the impact has been so far. Yeah, I, I would I, I would like to start with the bottom line. I think that in the information warfare, in the cyber warfare, the achievement of the West and, and US are surprisingly, uh, I, I believe, um, much better than the the achievements of the uh, of, of of the other side. And I will I will elaborate on that. Uh, first, there's. I, you're very right to say that it's a shockwave. It's a, a mag, you know a magmatic change in all the landscape of ransomware and cyber attack, uh, etc. I don't want to state the obvious and to list all the issues. Uh, you know, I have so many WhatsApp group that I I'm you know overwhelmed uh, and overloaded with with information and uh, another incident and another incident. So you know, I asked my uh, uh, good business partners, uh, Clear Sky and Confidas, to assist me in really uh, processing all the uh, all the information. What we and what we can say is that we see actually the classic um, development things that we 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 expected. For example. Um, before the ground invasion on February 24th, we saw two weeks of uh, Russian uh, state-backed attack on Ukrainian uh, website, infrastructure. It was, it was expected, it was obvious. Um, we saw information and influence, Russian influence campaign uh, throughout the, um, the, the the days leading to the uh, uh, to the invasion. Uh, one of the things that uh, we saw, we saw once the invasion started, we saw a, a huge uh, increase, a significant increase in classic ransomware attacks by the classic Russian-speaking uh, uh, Ragnarok, uh, Conti, mainly Conti, uh, on uh, European infrastructure, mainly oil and, and, and gas uh, uh, industry. We saw the Russian um, uh, ransom group, Conti, go out publicly uh, to say, we do support the Russian uh, 
uh, effort here and uh, we will uh, follow instructions, uh, uh, etc. Uh, we saw recently, in the last two days, it was published that uh, uh, Russian uh, cyber warfare is using Iranian and Belarusian uh, infrastructures uh, uh, to launch the cyber uh, attacks. And as expected, to some extent, we see um, the Russians, uh, the Russian government, we see the Russian authorities start to control the media in order to um, minimize the impact of information on the relevant publics, mainly in, in the big cities. But these are, these are the classic dots, but the new interesting development, things that we haven't seen before, and for me, as someone who goes into the human dimension of these threat actors and ransom group, is the immediate split between Russian and Ukrainians in the world of cyber uh, crime. You know, for us, the West, Russian, Ukrainian, Belarusians were all the same. It was Russian speaking. And when we handled uh, uh, our evil or our Uke or Conti or Ragnar Locker or Hive, they all were, you know, a Russian speaking group. But immediately once the war started, there was a split in human resources between the Ukrainian and the Ukrainian throughout the cyber uh, crime ecosystem said, we are now working against Russia. And that, that, was a tremendous that had a tremendous backlash first of all on all the russian operations because once one of the things that we learn is that the i would say the russian russian infrastructure of this uh, cyber uh, crime groups was very lean very thin and they really dependent on outsourced uh, warriors that were ukrainians and one of the, the interesting things that the Ukrainian did at the beginning of the warfare, their digital, the cyber uh, uh, minister, really uh, established the uh, uh, Ukrainian IT army. He issued a public call inviting all the Ukrainians and Ukrainian supporters, hackers, to join this Ukrainian government IT army, which didn't exist before, in order to launch a significant uh, campaign, cyber attack against Russian targets. And they were very successful. And Mori, um, is, that, is that a first, you know, to be able to mobilize, you know, IT workforce like that in, in the sake of, of national security? I mean, that's, that's got to be a first. For, it is, for a it is, sovereign it is, sovereign government yeah. saying, "Hey, join us in the fight against our our enemy." Uh, you know, and how was that that process? Uh, how did it happen in actuality, Moti? Like, do, did they had a sign up forms so they can like join? How how did that work? They had the sign up forms and they had centers all orchestrated by the government, but the same as you saw the uh, civil. Uh, recruitment and the the, mobi the the how they mobilize uh, the 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 people the civilians on you know preparing uh, uh, Molotov cocktails and building barricades from from iron and uh, you know uh, very uh, 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 primitive workshops uh, on the streets the same in the cyber sphere and we saw from the right beginning of this of this war we saw uh, attacks on Russian organizations, which until that moment felt very, very safe in this cyber um, uh, crime. Uh, Yandex, uh, Sberbank, uh, Russian, um, uh, Russian uh, government federal websites. There was on the second day, I think that the Russian uh, television, the official television, uh, was was hacked and for like five six minutes there were Ukrainian uh, nationalistic songs on the main Russian TV and that was a huge blow to the confidence of Russians and their reputation as those who control the uh, uh, the cyber uh, uh, sphere. Uh, that that was the Ukrainian uh, uh, response. Then we saw 
as uh, almost in parallel, a dramatic shift in the modes of operation of the Russian groups. If they used at the early days ransom and DDoS attack, we see uh, wiper attacks uh, in order to really create a significant damage to the uh, Ukrainians and European uh, uh, infrastructure. The third interesting dimension here in this uh, new uh, new things or new dots that, that we see is the um, Anonymous. Anonymous announced uh, that they are supporting Ukraine and then th they will start attacking or hacking uh, Russian uh, uh, targets. You know, the word. Uh, among uh, professionals or analysts or in cyber intelligence is that uh, probably CIA or FBI are behind like a, a, a anonymous per se, the level of uh, performance that they managed to perform in, at in attacking Russian targets is something which, according to analysts, is less characterized by classic anonymous, but more of a state. So whether the US or other Western countries are behind this anonymous uh, attacks, it doesn't matter because they are very effective. Another interesting dot is the uh, very quick, swift, effective deployment of Microsoft and Google defense umbrella to really protect against the Russian massive cyber uh, uh, attacks. We see now in this cyber war, we see the big technological companies uh, immediately dramatically taking aside, not only of cutting, not only cutting their ties, the commercial and business uh, uh, ties with, with Russia, but also actively uh, contribute uh, defense to the uh, Western and to the Ukrainian uh, side. We saw, we saw Elon Musk immediately providing uh, Starlink infrastructure, which later was, again, hacked by the Russians uh, to, to Ukraine. And it was done, and uh, the negotiations <laughs> uh, negotiation was done on Twitter, that the Ukrainian minister of cyber uh, said uh, on Twitter, Elon Musk, we do need, because we're under attack, we do need your satellite uh, uh, system. And you know, speak about satellite system, a new dot here in this warfare is the Russian attack on means of communication. Uh, Viasat, uh, a major satellite, a major communication uh, uh, provider, was attacked and really shut down uh, a significant um, communication and operational energy operation system around uh, uh, Europe. So. What we see is uh, the classic layer of what was expected as a, as, a, um, um, as a cyber war, but we saw in the last 10 days, um, you know, a fair, a, a reasonably fair amount, fair number of completely new modus operandi. What I'm interested, just as a queer, as curiosity, whether it was a natural development and evolvement, um, you know, organic growth of the uh, very strong pro-Ukrainian sentiment in the West, or these were pre-planned um, uh, operational plans um, by the uh, British intelligence, the American uh, uh, intelligence. So these, these are the developments. And I would, you know, I, I think that we can identify out of this huge amount of, of information, uh, five key insights with, which will govern also the future of this cyber crime and cyber warfare. You know, uh, I was industry. about to... I was about to say that every time there's uh, something monumental like this happens, like, you know, even during, you know, during the pandemic, which by the way, it's, you know, we all agreed it all ended, um, <laughs> you know, because of the conflict. Uh, but, uh, 
you know, for example, we've seen like uh, issues with supply chain. So like governments realize that they, they cannot rely on supply chain. It's been hosted <laughs> somewhere else. And here is the same case. You know, the Russians always realize that they, a lot of the infrastructure, the, the, you know, the supporting, you know, infrastructure for the, for the cyber um, command is not theirs. So how would that affect long term? Because, you know, it's not just this conflict. Everybody else is watching it. You know, all the all the sovereign countries are watching this, and they're 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 obviously going to analyze when the dust settles. They analyze what the lessons learns, and they're going to figure things out. Like you know, in terms of how can we make sure it doesn't happen to us. So it's going to be a, cu a couple key elements that they can take away from this. Yeah, I would I would uh, I would answer uh, your your uh, question, but I I want first to identify sure. these five key insights, and then the four. Very important, uh, what we, the four points, what we should look for in the future, which answers your, your question. I think that the first insight is that we face the end of Russian organization immunity era. Russian organizations uh, were not up until this war, Russian organization, institution, government, um, I, would, I would say, didn't really suffer cyber uh, attacks. But now, Russians' organizations are as well subject and will be subject to cyber uh, uh, attack. The second, all the uh, well-known but never evident links between the Russian-speaking groups and the Kremlin and the Russian government was is now in the open is was it was uh, uh, um, it was presented uh, you know Conti when Conti uh, went publicly against uh, Ukraine supporting Russia immediately an insider a developer uh, was uh, uh, leaked all Conti's uh, uh, data keys everything you know just analyzing uh, as we speak I'm sure that there are hundreds maybe of analysts analyze this tremendous treasure of Conti um, um, databases. And from there, we learn the, the direct link between some of the uh, hack groups and, uh, and, and the Russian authorities. The third insight has to do with another element which we didn't discuss. And this is the link uh, or the interface between cyber and uh, propaganda, information, influence, uh, uh, warfare. What we, you know, we had since the intervention, the claimed Russian intervention on the U.S. elections, we we had this this uh, uh, you know belief about the you know capabilities of Russia to really influence and the Russian propaganda, and we see today that the use of fake news by the Ukrainians, by the West, this, this mess of you don't know what is real and what is not real and what, what is fake, this really um, uh, offset completely the claimed Russian advantage in manipulating mindset, which means that the, the, the impressive Russian information warfare capability so far failed to produce a significant advantage for the Russians. And uh, uh, the fourth insight, we see what I told, we, we discovered that the West have very, very, has very powerful battalions, brigades, the big technological companies, which have all these, you know, challenging relations, uh, um, uh, Google, uh, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, uh, uh, Facebook in their contribution still yet to be uh, discussed. They immediately, as I said, provided a defense umbrella to the West. And that is something which we didn't see like two weeks ago. So that, that's, that's an important, when you uh, uh, zoom out and understand the cyber wolf uh, uh, battalions and forces, yes, the West does have this, this forces. And the fifth is that we see for the first time 
not an Israeli small military operation in Gaza, things that, you know, and a little bit of propaganda around it, but we see for the first time a full scale war accompanied by a, a, a cyber war, which is not yet a full scale cyber war. This is important to emphasize. We see a, a classic war on the ground with casualties, with destructions, with a flow of two million refugees, and we see, uh, um, you know, a, a, a serious level of cyber warfare, which still not yet reached, I would say, the the uh, nuclear cyber. And, uh, and and that's the first, right, Moti? Like that's, you know, the yeah. the kind of the kinetic, <clears throat> you know, excuse me, like kinetic um, and the the cyber. In conjunction, working together, that's that's a yeah. that's a first, right? In that scale, that's the first. Okay. That's the, in that scale. That's the first. Uh, you know, as as uh, uh, as an Israeli, we went through the, some kind of this, but but it was not not even close to that scale. Yes, that's a first. That's a first. And what we should expect, you know, I I think I will watch carefully. On, four, on I, I will be looking on four different directions. <coughs> Fourth, first, you know, once an agreement will be achieved, once a ceasefire will be achieved, whether it will be a week, whether it will be a month, whether it will be six months from now, to what extent the cyber crime scene will go to status quo ante. We have to remember that before the war, we all faced, you know, the cyber crime, a, a, a peak in ransomware attack. We had this conversation about what COVID did, a spike in ransomware and double extortion and triple extortion. And, you know, most of that, mo most of that industry was perpetrated uh, by, by Russian. Uh, but now everything completely dissolved. So the question is whether it will go back to status quo ante, more or less like COVID reality, okay? Or it we will see a completely different uh, uh, landscape of cyber uh, uh, crime. And it's uh, TBD, right, Moti? Nobody knows where, you know, where the new status quo is no. going to. Um, no. It's like it's like the oil prices, right? You don't know well, where, <laughs> you know the conflict is going to, you know, is going to stop, yeah. but we don't know where the oil price is going to land. You know, exactly. After the fact. Right. Exactly. The second, we will be watching on whether Russia will launch a cyber revenge after ceasefire. Depends on the agreement, depends on the results, depends on the level of satisfaction of Kremlin with the results of the war. We don't know. Russia, as I said at the beginning, I strongly encourage the West not to underestimate Russian might, Russian culture, Russian people resilience. When you look at the history of the Russian people, they went through very, very difficult time and they still the depth of culture, the contribution to art, science, history is something which should not be uh, underestimated. Uh, uh, President Obama, uh, calling, uh, you know, Russia, well, a mid-level uh, superpower, I think did a tremendous mistake in, you know, poking in the eye of, of this tradition. And Russians are extremely capable people. And uh, the question is whether Russia will retaliate on the cyber uh, 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 sphere. Uh, the third is, you know, being looking from a cybersecurity uh, uh, point of view, uh, once the dust settles, now there's a huge market of Russian organizations, Russian companies, which never thought that they will need all the cybersecurity uh, envelopes that we in the West are using. I, I can tell you that the level of cybersecurity of a classic I would say mid-sized level Russian company is nothing close to what we uh, uh, talk and encourage and, and, and build in the West. 
And now there's there's a huge market because also mid level and and Russian companies will require the cybersecurity envelope that we in the West uh, uh, it's, we it's use. It's so interesting. And Moti, what about all those Ukrainians that now have, you know, tremendous expertise around uh, you know cyber warfare? You know, they're going to be in mercenaries because again, that that experience is not trivial, right? To be able to, you know, to attack in real time. You know, exactly at that kind of scale you know all of a sudden you get these like hands-on experience with people making it look like the 8200 in our in our, in israel uh look like a like a child play compared to what these guys are doing right now oh oh yes and and now this this ukrainian uh uh, uh messenger is uh you know that that's a good question after the war in a year from now what they will do with this experience will they attack european for ransom or russian for ransom well, that's that's an interesting uh, an interesting uh, uh, development. or whoever pays more, you know, <laughs> Pro- probably whoever pays more, and then <laughs> and then how this reality and the Russian classic mindset of we don't negotiate with terrorists, how this will be transferred to the classic ransomware world in a year time when a big Russian industrial company will get really a financially motivated ransom. Nothing was, uh, will, will they pay or not? The same dilemmas that we have and that they never had. Uh, uh, well, and, Moti, and, I, think, and, I think your service is always going to be available for them, right, if they need some help. <laughs> yeah, well, probably I will charge more. Uh, <laughs> And, um, and 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 the last one, which is something that we haven't talked, and it's really worth the conversation. Not me, not with me, but with with uh, uh, crypto experts. If sanctions will continue, we will see a development of a crypto economy. And uh, with with this evolution, the crypto industry will be a much more attractive target. It's not that today, it's not. We know that hackers uh, love crypto uh, uh, companies, uh, not for ransom, but just for stealing the, 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 the cryptocurrencies. But uh, I would, uh, if, I, if I had money to invest, I would invest in companies uh, which develop a security envelope and cybersecurity uh, uh, tools to protect cryptocurrencies, uh, uh, miners and companies, because the crypto economy will definitely uh, uh, grow. I love that, Moti. And uh, you know, we should do this again soon. I'll do another update. I'll, uh, you know, after this, because it seems like these current events are, you know, are as you mentioned before. Um, there's just so much information out there, and there's no one person that can distill all of that and make sense of all of that. So. Much, much appreciated. You provide some clarity in terms of the current Thanks. events. You know, really appreciate and uh, you know, absolutely great insight. So uh, let's let's uh, reconvene again. Uh, let's let the people digest this stuff, um, and uh, and then uh, we'll go from there. In, in the meantime, Moti, what's the easiest way for people to reach out to you for any, <laughs> for any uh, advice or any additional insight? Uh, you know, Moti Crystal on Google, you get to my uh, uh, website. Any any negotiation challenge that you have, uh, either in cyber or with your partners, uh, uh, business partners, I'm, I, I will be very happy to help. Given the fact that currently I'm being, uh, you know, definitely worry about global, uh, on, on a global scale, how to support and how to contribute to a ceasefire as soon as possible. Perfect. Thank you very much. And I hope that we, you know, in a couple of weeks, we'll, we'll have just that and I'll be able to, to chat about the kind of the post post events. Uh, so thank you. In the meantime, thank you very much thank you, David, for having me. Thanks. All Bye-bye. of those who joined, uh, be well offline and as well as online.